because Dark Souls wasn't hard enough, I decided to challenge all of you to make as many souls as you could in one hour from a brand new character, Glitchless. The rules of this challenge are simple. No mods of any kind that affect gameplay, no major glitches or bugs, and as I've said, you must attempt the challenge on a brand new character. The person with the most unused souls at the end of the hour will win $500 USD. There were over 30 entrants and some of your runs had some tragic endings. And as much as I love to show each and every attempt, in the interest of time, we'll be following the stories of the top three competitors who submitted a run on time. Before we begin though, if you competed, then I want to personally thank you for taking the time to send your clips in. All of your names are on screen right now, and you'll be able to find everyone's final soul count at the end of the video. If it weren't for you guys and the rest of the people watching this, then my channel wouldn't be growing as much as it is, so thank you. I also want to thank this video's sponsor, me. I'm not rich, and $500 is kind of a lot of money, so if you want to support the channel so that I can do more challenges... Shut up, nerd. No one's going to subscribe. Dork Moon Blade starts off his run as an assassin, likely because they start with the Spook spell, which is really useful for negating fall damage and sneaking around enemies. He's gonna challenge Gundir, and his fight is going well so far. It seems his strategy is to constantly circle Gundir while he two hands his weapon. He does take a few hits, but the first boss goes down without much trouble, and as soon as he gets the Fire Link, he's gonna buy some Fire Bombs, Prism Stones, and a large leather shield. Interesting selection. Looks like he's gonna no scope a Titanite Lizard on the opposite side of the wall. He gets a tree jump on his first try, which is very impressive, and trades the shield and stones away for some Twinkling Titanite. Of course, he also picks up the Silver Serpent Ring, which is very much a necessity for this run, seeing as it increases all souls gained from defeated enemies by 10% rounded down. Fun fact the plus 3 version of this ring yields a whopping 35% bonus. Once Dork Moon gets to the high wall, he picks up a few fire bombs and heads down into this room to pick up the Undead Hunter Charm. I wonder what he's going to use that for. Jordian's run also starts off as an assassin, only he takes the Black Fire Bomb as his gift. His Gundir fight is nothing short of flawless, not missing a single parry and killing him in about 35 seconds. Jordian has clearly spent a lot of time optimizing this fight and time will tell if that extends to the rest of his run. Unfortunately, his tree jump is not as optimized, and it takes him about three tries to get up. Once he finally does, he's going to trade a black firebomb for a titanite chunk before grabbing the silver serpent ring. If I had to guess, the dagger is going to come in handy for quick stepping through the cathedral and the swamp. Jordian displays exceptional movement as he makes his way through the high wall, where he picks up the gold pine resin, a broadsword, and makes a stop at this dubious chest, also known as the game's first mimic. And I'm sure you can probably guess what he's looking for here. That's right, the symbol of avarice. A rare drop from Mimics which adds about 50% more souls from defeated enemies and stacks with other soul increasing items. Don't quote me here, but I think the drop rate is about 5% give or take and he got really lucky. No spoilers, but I asked Jordian how many times he had to reset in order to get this first try and he said at least 30. Our third competitor goes by Fort NJ and when he starts off his run it looks like he's been at it for a while too. His Gunder fight goes about as smoothly as it could have gone with multiple perfectly timed parries and a charged strong attack to finish him off. This was supplemented by a first try tree jump as he picks up the silver serpent ring and buys a short sword from the maiden. He decides not to buy a dagger though. Maybe he has other plans for fair and keep? In any case, he makes his way through the high wall and he's gonna breeze right past the mimic and instead pick up a few souls and fire bombs along the way. It looks like speed is the name of the game for Fort. He's gonna use Spook to skip the room with the Assist Shard, and we'll see if he ends up regretting that later on. And versus Vort, he has the fight down to a science. After the phase 2 dash attacks, he staggers Vort during his Ice Breath and the Riposte finishes him off. The other competitors are just as successful with each one taking away 3300 souls, except for Jordian, whose Symbol of Avarice grants him 4950. When Dork Moon arrives in the Undead Settlement, he picks up this charcoal pine resin and quickly finds himself at this cliff before the elevator which lets you skip a large portion of the map. While he's trying to line up his jump, these thralls start destroying him and you can tell that he was spooked. Jesus fucking Christ. Spook is going to help him survive both jumps and after lighting the bonfire, he's actually going to turn around and start fighting the Outrider Knight. This is very risky at his current level. These guys are super fast. Luckily he doesn't die and he picks up the Aerithil Straight Sword which has got to be what he plans on using his Twinkling Titanite for. 
He's gonna throw on the Ring of Sacrifice in case things go south with the Watch Dogs, and they almost do. Eventually though, both of them jump to their deaths, and Dork is able to pick up an Estus Shard. He's gonna sell a few souls back at Firelink and buy a torch from the Maiden to use in tandem with a straight sword. If you're unfamiliar with this strategy, this weapon is really good for low level runs given its high base damage, and most importantly its ability to inflict frostbite. Quite a few of the game's bosses are susceptible to frost, and normally there's a frost timer which has to count down before you can frostbite them again, but if he hits them with the torch, then the timer is reset. There is a catch though. If Dorkmoon's gonna use the weapon effectively, then he has to invest some souls in its requirements. Heading into the Undead Settlement, Jordan's also gonna grab the Charcoal Pine Resin, only his elevator jump goes a lot smoother. After giving Secret a small concussion, Old friend. he grabs two Tide Night Shards and the Road of Sacrifices, which will probably go toward reinforcing that broadsword he picked up earlier, and he gets a really lucky break on his way to Farron Keep when both Watchdogs score a hit on him. Fortunately, they both fall to their deaths too, and Jordian equips the Fallen Knight armor for some extra poison resist as he navigates the swamp. Here he's going to use some of his burial gifts on the slugs at the base of the ladder before heading up and grabbing the Dream Chaser's Ashes which unlock the ability to purchase Titanite Shards back at Firelink. This is going to open the door for him to reach plus 4 in his broadsword which he plans on using in his next big fight, the Abyss Watchers. Jordian seems to have this fight pretty optimized too. He preemptively dodges a jumping attack from the main Watcher which pretty much guarantees him a backstab. When two more Watchers join the fight, Jordian parries one and then backstabs the other while they're busy fighting each other. Somehow, Jordian makes the second phase look even easier than the first, essentially turning the fight into a backstab simulator. Once he's done, he equips the symbol of avarice and makes out like a bandit with 30,000 souls. That's a lot of souls. Hopefully he doesn't die or anything. Ford spares Secret the headache and a well-timed roll gets him past the Outrider Knight with ease. He's gonna pick up the twin daggers that this half-naked woman is guarding and use those to quickstep through the swamp instead. He uses a few boss souls on the elevator up to the roof, and here he also picks up some Titanite shards among other things before heading back to upgrade his weapon of choice, the regular short sword. This may come as a surprise, but this weapon is phenomenal for PvE. You can get it very early, the requirements are low, and so is its stamina cost, which I think is actually the lowest out of all the straight swords. The only downside is the range, but if you're staying right on top of the boss the entire time, then that isn't really much of an issue. Force gonna trade away some of the fire bombs he picked up earlier for some Titanite shards, and then he takes on the Abyss Watchers himself. This fight for him goes well too, but he does have a few close calls. He gets a sick parry on the main Watcher, and when he walks back to set up the next one, his timing's a little bit off, but he rolls just in time to avoid a follow up. After finishing these guys off, he makes his way through the catacombs before diving into Smoldering Lake, and this area is rife with useful items like Titanite shards, and perhaps most notably King Vendrick's Shield of Want. This shield is an item that also grants more souls per enemy fallen, and each contestant picks it up. Fort lets the Ballista, Dark Souls 3's largest enemy, take out the Sandworm, and he's rewarded with about 8,000 souls, a miracle, and a bone shard. Now he's going to return to Firelink and reinforce it to plus 7 before heading back to the Catacombs to take on Wolnir. Wait, did he just die to Wolnir? Dorkmoon decides to take on the Crystal Sage first, and his strategy is working like a charm. Since the Crystal Sage is weak to Frost, all it takes is three swings of his straight sword for the Frost to build up, and he manages to reset it with his torch. He does get a little bit unlucky when the Sage teleports away rather quickly, but after about a minute and a half, the Crystal Sage goes down, and Dork makes a pit stop outside the Cathedral to pick up the Paladin's Ashes. This item is very important because it's going to allow him to buy something very special from the Maiden, Undead Hunter Charms. After a few upgrades, he is going to buy a few of these charms before heading over to the channel's mascot at the High Wall of Lothric. If you've never done this before, you can actually farm mimics by continuously throwing undead hunter charms at them and then checking to see if they dropped anything. If it did, then the item should appear in its mouth. If nothing shows up and you're unlucky, you can hit the mimic again to put it back to sleep and throw another charm at it to try again. After about 4 tries and even using some rustic coins, he doesn't get it. Dorkmoon's a good sport though. He shakes it off and heads over to Emma to do something incredibly ambitious and that's take on the Dancer at close to base level. This should come as no surprise given her appearance, but the Dancer is actually immune to Frost, which means that the Frostbite status won't be too helpful here. Two-handing the sword though should give Dorkmoon enough damage output to take her on anyway. Meanwhile, Jordian also picks up the same items Fort did in the Smoldering Lake, and he's gonna bump his broadsword up to plus 7. From here, he takes on the Crystal Sage, and this fight belongs in a textbook. 
A parry takes the Sage's HP down just enough so that he won't teleport, and a second one gives Jordian time to use a Pine Resin, which does significantly more damage. This allows him to effectively skip the entire second phase of the fight. From here, he also picks up the Paladin's Ashes, but he's planning on using them for something else. During his trip through the graveyard, he throws on the Shield of Want for the Souls bonus in case any of the enemies happen to die, which is smart because every soul matters. Once he's in the cathedral, he's going to run past the giant and pick up Lloyd's Sword Ring, which gives him a 10% attack bonus whenever he's at full HP. This should go a long way in helping him kill these bosses faster, and he's going to put it to use immediately by taking on the Deacons. This is a pretty routine fight, and nothing noteworthy happens here until Jordan throws an alluring skull to distract the mob while the Arc Deacon appears. He throws it a little bit too early, and the Deacons come back to their senses and almost kill him. Jordan recovers nicely though, and his soul count climbs to about 148,000. Remember the Paladin's Ashes from earlier? Well, back in Firelink, he's going to give those to the Maiden so that he can buy the Lloyd Shield Ring, which will act as an insurance policy versus the next boss, the Dancer. After taking his revenge on Wolnir and resorting to BM, Fort decides to freestyle a bit and starts collecting items from all over Lordran, but specifically from many bosses near bonfires. This was an interesting take and very low risk considering how close they are to each bonfire. For instance, he kills Pontiff's Beast in Irithyll, the Stray Demon on top of Farron Keep, and the Outrider Knight by the Road of Sacrifices. In total, his scavenger hunt only takes about 3 minutes, and once he's done collecting all of the low-hanging fruit, he decides to take his shot at beating the Dancer at base level. His fight is going well so far. His sword's range is, well, short, and it does cause him to miss a few combos here and there. A poorly timed roll sends Fort packing with about 20 minutes left in his run. His rematch with the Dancer is intense, and there are more than a few close calls. In the end though, he does come out on top and makes his way into Lothric Castle with about 228,000 souls. A little bit of patience and a few quit outs gets him past the mobs in the castle, and just before his Dragon Slayer fight, he takes a page out of Dorkmoon's book and dual wields the Irithyll Straight Sword with his Fire Infused Short Sword so that he too can reset the Frost Timer on the boss. I found this very resourceful of him, and much more effective than the torch. His plan is solid, a tip for this fight is to wait for the Dragon Slayer armor to do his 3 hit combo with the axe, and then you want to roll late on the third swing, and after he misses he's vulnerable for a few hits. Fort's gonna get hit unexpectedly by the butterflies, and while he's healing, with only 10 minutes left can he pick up his souls in time? Once Dorkmoon defeats the Dancer, he's going to enter Lothric Castle and lure this bloodthirsty Outrider Knight from the storage room so that he can pick up some more Twinkling Titanite. Now that his sword is plus 4, he's going to take on the Dragon Slayer armor, and the Irithyll Straight Sword in this fight works wonders. Just look at that damage. Two hits is all it takes to inflict Frostbite on the Dragon Slayer because of how low his frost resistance is, and Dorkmoon sends the boss into phase 2 with a torch of all things. When the Dragon Slayer gets back up, Okay. Round 2 with the armor goes much more smoothly and Dorkmoon's gonna head over to Osiris for his attempt. I'm expecting this fight to go really well given that Osiris is also weak to Frost, but that'll ultimately depend on how well Dorkmoon can stay under him and whether or not Osiris chooses to fight out in the open. In Phase 1, Dork does a great job of playing around the Dragon's Breath. When using melee in this fight, you always want to make sure to look out for that move so that you can move back because the damage in that mist racks up quickly. After a little bit of back and forth, things start to go sideways when the dragon dashes into the corner, and Dorkmoon's forced to deal with the real boss, the camera. I muted the audio, but I could hear his frustration here, and it's completely understandable. This fight can be tough. He cleans up very nicely though, and with about 15 minutes left in his run, he's going to head over to Champion Gundyr. When Fort re-enters the arena, he's going to go straight for his... Wait, is he fighting the Dragon Slayer? No, Fort, what are you doing? Get your souls! Okay, he grabs his souls off the ground and prepares for a rematch. This attempt was much more put together than the first. The only scary part was when the butterflies finally started attacking, he almost rolled right off the cliff. After winning, he takes a little bit of time to celebrate and wraps up his run by killing the Crystal Sage, and then heading back to Firelink where he goes full hollow and senselessly murders three NPCs. 
He sells all of their belongings, including his own, and ends his run with 379,243 souls. In Jordan's attempt, it is very apparent that the dancer has really awkward timing on a lot of her attacks, and for this challenge alone, I watched her end many runs. Jordian, however, is doing a good job of staying behind her the entire time and avoiding her spin attack. After killing her at base level, he goes from 147,000 to 266,000 souls, and it looks like he's going to take on Osiris next. With his current setup, this fight is a war of attrition, as every hit only does about 200 damage, and Osiris has a little over 8,000 HP. While Osiris' attacks are fast and can be very sporadic, as I mentioned earlier, if you can stay right under him the entire time, then it's possible to win this fight without getting hit once. Jordian narrowly blocks this dash attack, and with two more swings of his sword, he puts Osiris down for good. With 381,000 souls in his inventory and 15 minutes remaining, he's also going to head over to Champion Gundir. His fight starts, and it doesn't even last 60 seconds. Jordian's parries are immaculately timed, and there isn't really much else to say about this fight. After putting Gundir down, he sets his sights on Yorm next. He knows that even at base level, with the Storm Ruler, he should be able to defeat him very quickly. In order to reach him though, he's going to have to make his way through Irithyll, and just before reaching the dungeon... Much like his corrupted Gundir fight, Dorkmoon does not go for parries, and instead chooses to roll around Gundir, only this time he has the Irithyll straight sword. Fortunately, Champion Gundir also shares a weakness to Frost, so about 3 hits is all he needs to inflict Frostbite. Gundir lands a grab here, and Dorkmoon contemplates quitting out, but he realizes that he can survive it, so he just takes the damage. As I'm watching this footage, I forgot how cool Champion Gundir's moveset was. I should probably remaster my Gundir run now that I know how to rebind animations. Anyway, after beating the champion, Dorkmoon's at 277,000, and he uses his last 10 minutes doing one of the most well-known farming methods in the entire game, killing Lothric Knights. After using all of his souls, Dorkmoon finishes his run with 452,282 souls. Jordian was extremely nervous. With about 10 minutes left in his run, he manages to pick up his souls, but almost dies again. He doesn't let this stop him though. He keeps pushing through Irithyll Dungeon, and some strategic jumps get him down to the Profane Capital in no time at all. When he does finally get to Yorm, he's able to pick up the Storm Ruler and bait Yorm into missing attacks. Only then does he go for his own. To take his soul count even higher, with just 4 minutes left, he goes back through Irithyll Dungeon and enters Arc Dragon Peak to take on the Ancient Wyvern. There is only one way he's going to be able to do this in time. He needs to end the fight early with a quick plunge, but that requires the Wyvern to use his Flame Breath. After using a few boss souls, Jordian's nerves really start to get to him. After missing three plunges, he finally gets the fourth, with just seconds remaining on the clock. With his last bit of remaining time, he uses the rest of his boss souls, and Jordian ends his run with 795,438 unused souls. Amazing. Towards the end here, you can see that Jordian had planned to take on the old Demon King for an additional 55,000 souls, but his death in Irithyll and the missed Wyvern quick plunges caused him to run out of time. There really wasn't any room for error in this run. With that said, I want to thank everyone who competed. As I said in the beginning, I wouldn't have been able to make this video without you guys, and if you want to be notified of challenges in the future, make sure you subscribe because I plan on doing many more with even bigger prize pools as the channel continues to grow. What are you, so what are you going to do with the prize money? What are you going to do with the 500? Since Christmas is getting close, I'll probably keep at least half of it for myself so I can get some nicer presents to my family and close relatives.